Okay. Hey. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the DeMott Sisters Theological Roundtable. I'm the Reverend Lori DeMott from the Union University Church in Alfred, New York. Sitting with me virtually is Reverend Wendy Fambro from the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Rochester, New York, and Reverend Sandra Hasenauer, who is, I believe, the Executive Minister of the American Baptist Churches of Rochester, Genesee Region, and others. Right? Crap, well, that close yeah. enough? Yeah, well, we'll I'll figure that out later. We'll talk about that a little bit. More. So I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves more fully in a second, but because I'm the oldest, and as they've always claimed, the bossiest, I'm going to hold on center stage, and I'm going to explain to you what we are hoping will happen today. So when COVID-19 spread to New York last week, all of our churches had to suspend worship services and all church gatherings. And as Wendy, Sandy, and I talked about how to approach this new reality, we decided we would like to take advantage of the situation and try to do something that we have really not done before, which is discuss theology. Oh, now, God. it may surprise <laughs> you to hear that three ordained ministers in the same family don't often talk about theology, but when we get together, we talk about what everyone talks about with their families, which is mostly our kids. We don't sit around the Thanksgiving table discussing the hermeneutical implications of rhetorical criticism on the pastoral epistles. True. Don't worry. Although next Thanksgiving, gonna... maybe. <laughs> next, uh, there we wow. go. Uh, dinner chat. <laughs> but we're not going to be talking about that specifically either today. What we're going to be talking about today is the nature of the church what we think it means to be a church, especially when the church can't gather physically as a congregation. In other words, when two or three are gathered together in Christ's name in cyberspace, will Christ still be among us? And how do we experience that? So before we get into that topic, we wanna to take a moment to tell you a little bit about ourselves, because even though all three of us are ordained, we are all serving the church in different ways. So that gives us slightly different perspectives on the question. And we're going to start the introductions with, I keep pointing down because Wendy's below on the screen. <laughs> Looks like the Brady Bunch. But um, anyway, so we're going to start with Wendy and she's going to uh, introduce herself and tell us a little bit briefly about her church. So I am the minister at Emanuel Baptist Church in Rochester, New York. Um, and I've been in ministry for 33 years, which is a very holy number. <laughs> um, what makes me sort of unique in, among the sisters is uh, that I've always been bi bivocational, uh, sometimes trivocational. <laughs> so, and I just actually this morning had to write down a quick list of other jobs I've had because I've done a million other things. So I have been an interpreter for the deaf, taught ESL to migrant workers. Uh, I've been a captionist for deaf students at Cornell. I have been a nanny, a barista. <laughs> I have hawked children's books. Um, currently, I'm teaching Tai Chi and other wellness programs for Lifespan of Rochester, mainly serving caregivers of people with Alzheimer's dementia. Um, so I've always done church and other things. So that's sort of my unique perspective in this. Sandy. Um, oh, I am so tempted to list so many ways that I am the unique sister, however. <laughs> You know, because wait, can as, we list them? Yes, as, <laughs> as we youngest tend to do. Um, however, I will be snarky and say that's the Reverend Doctor Sister to you. Um, <laughs> but I am Reverend Doctor Sandy Hasenauer. I am the Executive Minister of American Baptist Churches of Rochester Genesee Region, which um, incorporates forty-eight churches in ten different states. Don't ask. It would take us half an hour for me to even explain how that happened, but. That's what it is. Um, thoroughly enjoy the role. And um, to be honest, I am probably the one that has been in training for being stuck at home and working from home because I've spent the better part of the last 10 years doing exactly this, um, having online conference calls and video calls and doing webinars and that sort of thing. So um, I've been taking advantage of that in the ways that we connect together as churches in the region during this time. And I've got two dogs, but that's not unique I've, among I've us got, sisters. We all have dogs. dogs. <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a dog, Wendy? Not yeah. currently, no. Yeah, I didn't think no, so. she moved away from her dog, so we need to rectify that. Nope. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. You can... <laughs> okay, my turn? Yes. Please. Yes. Okay, oh. so um, I, as I said, am Lori DeMott. I'm the minister of the Union University Church in Alfred, and we are a non-denominational community church. Um, I've been serving there for, I beat you, Sandy, 
36 and a half years. Uh, I came to Alfred in 1983. I intended to only be here for about three years because I wanted to go back to school to get a PhD in biblical studies. But I ended up staying for a lot of reasons, but partly because I'm a country girl at heart. Alfred is a small college town. It has two universities here, Alfred University and SUNY Alfred. And we're set in a very rural part of Western New York. And that remote setting has really impacted us as a church during this crisis. So as you can see, I'm recording this from my car uh, <laughs> where it's like 26 degrees because our sanctuary does not have Wi-Fi. My home internet connection's too slow for a really good quality stream. So I'm actually sitting in the parking lot behind the library at Alfred University to record this. I'm picking up their bandwidth. Uh, so, and I've been here for a lot of Zoom meetings this week. And the thing I keep thinking is I really need to clean this car. So I'm glad you can't see what I'm sitting in. So. so that's a little bit about who we are. And I want to now get to the theology portion of this program. As I said, when two or three are gathered together in Christ's name and Sire space, will Christ be among us? And how do we experience that? And this part, except for what I'm going to say at the very beginning, this is not scripted. Uh, it's not really planned. It's just we're going to be talking about this and kind of bouncing things off of one another. So I'm going to start with the comment that while I obviously believe that the church does uh, continue to exist, even if we can only gather virtually, what I've really been grappling with this week is what parts of the church are most important to maintain if we're going to be a virtual church and what parts of church life are kind of incidental to the calling of the church. Mm -hmm. So is it necessary to have a sermon to be a church? Is it necessary to have communion and Eucharist? Uh, and mostly, how do you prevent worship from becoming a production that's consumed just like a show on Netflix? I think that the church in general has really two elements to it. One is the participatory element of sharing prayer concerns, responsive readings, singing hymns and everything. And then the other is the consuming portion, which is really designed to help an individual with their spiritual experience, which would be sermons, um, the meditative music, the kinds where a person's just sitting there listening. And all of that generally happens in the same place at the same time in worship on Sunday morning. So when you go to a virtual church and you can't necessarily do the participatory and the consuming part at the same time, what is most important? And are you still a church if you're doing that all in little bits and pieces throughout the week virtually? Um, so I, I actually have more questions than I have answers. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to throw that out now and see what you guys think, and then maybe we can talk about it some more. Hopefully we can talk about it. That's what we're here for. See, Lori's the oldest, though. She's supposed to have the answers. <laughs> the wisdom. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to you guys, and then I'm going to tell you where you're wrong. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there. Okay. And then that's when I plug my ears and go stomping out. <laughs> right, the right, right. Um, I, I'll jump in here, Wendy, to give you a little more time to, to think about this. Um, some of my first thoughts, <laughs> because I'm so steeped right now in Baptist polity and principles and all of that because of other things I've got going on, um, one of the things that would matter is is what your denominational tra uh, tradition right. is, because okay. in the Baptist church, the, the word is, I mean, that's why we have pulpits kind of front and center, and that's the, the sermon is kind of a big piece of that. However, um, I, I do not serve an individual church right now. I'm, you know, bouncing around, but I know when I preach, I've been trying to imagine what it would feel like for me to sit here at my desk and preach into my webcam. And that would be really, really difficult yeah, it is. Um, because preaching comes out of community and you rely on the energy of the community while you're preaching and you, and you have, um, well, you should have eye contact, <laughs> you know, and things like that when you're preaching. Um, so for me, the question becomes, how do you preach out of community how you know um obviously we're in a time when a lot of people are are doing that and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with it certainly that's kind of how we're dealing with that um but it's hard for me to imagine how that would feel because just your energy and everything would i would think would feel very different because you're not in that community during that time 
Right. And it may be that the, the congregation, the person who's receiving it, doesn't feel any different because right. I know people listen to podcasts, but you're right. I tried kind of preaching just to my computer. It felt really weird. It just yeah, yeah. didn't feel like I was having that energy from the congregation. I think because Maybe. I so often am the preacher, um, as are you, that for me, that is less a significant part of worship, actually, <laughs> than other people experience it as being. Um, so for me, the the main gift of church over these years has been that it's just such an intentional uh, mix of community. So it's the only space in my life where we are intentionally combining ages, genders, sexualities, nationalities, socioeconomic realities, all of that stuff. It's intentional and it's a shared story space. Um, so. I am actually hoping that maybe there's a, an opportunity here in cyberspace to even more greatly expand that. The puzzle being then, how is it an authentic space of sharing? Um, so right. it's not just people sort of signing in. And look, I have people signing in from India. Um, <laughs> that doesn't particularly expand my world. And it's all about me, so, you know. Um, <laughs> so how do we, for me, how do we recreate the space that's really authentically sharing? Um, I feel like the gift of small churches, and all of us have a lot of experience with smaller churches, is that it's, it really is a genuine sharing. It's not just a place where people kind of walk in a door, sing songs and leave or whatever. Um, that it's a place where we know that, you know, Nancy's been dealing with a neighbor who's having heart surgery. So when she's sort of updating us all, we are all feeling that, we all experience that with her. Um, so it's a place where you're known and um, as much as you want to be known. So that's the piece that I'm really looking to see what we can do in a cyber world that maybe is even more than we can normally do. You know, the word you used, um, and this may be because it harkens back to my English major undergraduate roots, but when you talked about the stories, sharing the stories, and ultimately um, the church was born out of the story and it was um, people coming together. If you look back at the ancient church, it was just people coming together to share their stories of Jesus, either stories they knew and had experienced or stories that they had received through scripture. Um, many of our hymns and songs essentially are trying to tell a story and there's always been a fascination with the stories behind the hymns, you know, when we, we hear about so-and-so wrote a hymn, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember who wrote what, but... Um, John Newton, the, Amazing the one Grace. With the, well, the, yeah, the Sea Billows Roll, too, was one, you know, that has a backstory to it about when this hymn got written. Um, that that makes those hymns more meaningful, because you know the story of what they came out of. And I almost wonder, again, because I'm used to being in this format. So for me, video conferencing actually feels very comfortable. And I do feel like I've got relationships with people who are on the other side of the video. Um, you can still share the stories. You know, that's still an important part of church. You can still do that. And in fact, perhaps do it more easily. Because when people walk into a church building and sit in a sanctuary, they are automatically putting themselves in a, re a receivership mode. Right, the consumer mode. The consumer mode. That, that here, I would prefer to use receivership. It doesn't sound quite so capitalist. <laughs> now, okay, that's the minister you know, word the for minister consumer. The minister word, receivership. <laughs> um, but you're sitting in a pew and you're watching what's going on up there, and you may get to participate in some ways, but for the most part, it's what's happening up there. Whereas when you're in this format, um, if you if you really embrace what this format makes possible, then it can be much more highly participatory. There's tricks to how to make that work better um, that I think all of us will get better at doing the more everybody gets used to this format. Sandy's um, the tricky one. <laughs> I'm the tricky one. Um, but for me, yeah, a lot of church is about the stories and a, a lot of, you know, the community that you were just talking about, Wendy, that, you know, we know what's happening with um, 
Nancy's neighbor because she's been telling us the stories and we know Nancy's story and we know why this neighbor is so important to her. Um, yeah, that's streaming to Facebook where it is just people kind of clicking in yeah, and receiving. Not... You do sort of lose a little bit of that. Yeah, we, we had tried looking at, you know, just streaming to Facebook Live or something, but we really felt the participatory part of it was not there. And I, I, a couple things. Um, first of all, somebody, and unfortunately, this is the problem with doing it like this. I can't tell you who said this, but somebody uh, was writing a book about church and ministry, and they said there are really three functions of, they were probably talking about ministry, not the church, but it was tell the story, break the bread, love the people. And I really liked that condescension, con con <laughs> condensation, <laughs> condensation of uh, what, you know, what it really is. It's that simple. Just tell the story, break the bread and love the people. Uh, I think the other thing that all of us probably struggle with is we are all very, as our family, we come out of this family that's very lay oriented, very mm -hmm. uh, priesthood of the believer, all believers and everything. I have struggled all of my life in ministry of not being seen as the, I'm going to be the spiritual wisdom uh, for you. And you just sit there and take in what I have to say. My experience is that my congregation doesn't always agree with me on that, that they, they insist on constantly putting me in, in this position of having more spiritual wisdom than they do. I don't believe that. But, you know, so there's that struggle of how do you, how do you make the church into this community of believers, but still recognize that there are within that community certain people who are more spiritually gifted in leadership than others. And it's not necessarily the minister, but that, you know, you just have all of those different dynamics going on in a church. So as, as Sandy said, we are coming out of definitely a congregational uh, experience and, and thinking. And so things like Eucharist might not be as important to all of us to have on a day, uh, weekly basis as it would be for somebody coming out of an Episcopalian kind of experience but no but the first sunday is coming up which is yeah <laughs> that's that's for a, a lot of protestant churches that's the communion sunday and and being and palm sunday coming up and that's, being palm sunday you know, so that's some of the conversation i've already had com conversation and i've seen some things on facebook with some clergy around how do you do communion um and i've seen a variety of responses to that one church might be trying a drive-through window time, which i know I'm not describing it well. The way they described it sounded much more holy and sacred than, you know, drive through window. Um, <laughs> and I'll take some fries with my grape juice. <laughs> yeah, with the grape juice. Um, you know, and, and when I was talking directly with a couple of folks on a conference call, we talked about doing communion by phone um, because sometimes you might have to do that with a homebound or a shut-in rather than bringing communion to somebody. Could you say to them, get yourself some bread, get yourself some juice. I'll call you, I'll have my bread and my juice and we'll do it together by phone so that you're still feeling the um, strength of the words that have historically been held, uh, handed down to us. You're still doing it in community. Um, you're just not necessarily sitting right next to each other. And of course uh, that brings up the problem that I know in my congregation, I'm sure your congregations, not everybody can do this. They can't all go virtual. Right. because they don't have the tech and so th there's also the struggle of how do you make sure those people are part of the church experience and yeah and how do they remain part of our lives too it's not just us right. sort of serving them but you know there are people in my church that sometimes bug me can get on my nerves but <laughs> do I we need to edit that part yeah. out? <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it's it's part of community and right i keep thinking about the difference between like showing up at work versus showing up at church or really any place else and at work you know i really like the people i work with we sort of chit chat you know and it's a it's a nice thing but nobody there is going to say you know how are you really doing and how you know, how does this impact your struggle with the meaning of existence and, you know, God and global things? Because, you know, you're at work. Right. But the church, that's why we go there, is to get in the mud and wrestle with these questions with people that we know care about us, whether or not we're bugging them that Sunday. I'm sure I bug a few people too, probably right now. <laughs> um, so to me, 
you know, I think we also come from a family of introverts. Let's fess up right now. We're all in. Yeah, the quarantine is no problem. Not a problem. problem. <laughs> part of us is like, yes. Yay. Um, but the other part, I have to be really honest with myself that God forcing me into ministry for all of these freaking years, no matter how many times I've tried to get out of it, has given me a community of support I never, yeah. ever would have had, ever. Um, so and, and forcing us to, as you said at the very beginning, Wendy, be with people that we would not choose to necessarily be with. You know, these are when you go into a congregation, you don't get to say, well, I'm going to worship with these three people over here and the rest of you leave me alone. You know, you're you're in there with all of those people and that um, being forced to experience not just experience being forced to experience and to love this diverse group of people, not just in terms of race or gender or anything else, but just personality uh, is really stretching. A person. I think for me, that is part of where I find God is knowing that God is that broad. So again, going back to the virtual thing, you know, I, I, I kept thinking, what is it about church that makes it hard for us to say, we're just going to close for eight weeks. We're just going to take a break. You know, why can't you just do that? Well, it's because somehow my experience of God and humanity is really tied to having to sit with those people, not having to, enjoying <laughs> sitting with all these people. She loves would, you, Alfred. Really. I really do. <laughs> Love you. Tells Love us you. all the time. <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, C.S. Lewis said something about that, that <laughs> I'm not going to be able to come up with the quote, but it was something in screw tape letters, I think, about how having to kneel, because he was Episcopalian, having to kneel next to the guy who's got bad breath and creaky knees is part of the the experience of worship I that was say, a terrible Lord, quote <laughs> well you just made me feel a hundred times better and i hope that all of my executive minister friends see this because i have a reputation based on a time i stood up in a large group of people to ask a question and i started out by saying i read something in some book by someone <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember even what the topic of the book was, but here's the quote. <laughs> and so, it's kind of like this. <laughs> it's kind of like this. Everybody, it's genetic. Let's just say that right it is. now. It's, it's genetic. genetic. Um, I, I have really, I, to a degree, I feel like I've been in a bit of an observational post because I've just been watching churches kind of work through this and do it in different ways and but hearing the pastors all talk about what their greatest concern was um yeah some of it has been about getting sunday morning worship somehow online so people can experience it most of it has been around community how do we still stay engaged in community and so that really is to me what church is and it's what church is at its best, and it's also what church is at its worst. Um, we are human beings. We don't always know how to be in community in healthy ways, but we also know how to come together in times like this. Everybody is worried about what about the, the elders in our congregations, and frankly, our congregations are made up of a whole lot of elders. How do we make sure they're taken care of? Can we make sure they're getting their groceries, make sure they're getting um, phone calls so they're not feeling isolated? There's been a tremendous sense of saying, because we are part of the family of Christ, we do take care of each other. It's just not even a question. That's just what we do. Um, and I think, you know, as you've said, yes, the three of us have grown up in a family where I used to say that whenever anybody asked me how many siblings I had, I never really knew what to answer right. because we always has, had extra people living with us. Um, so we did grow up in that kind of unique situation, but I see that over and over again in churches, regardless of what kinds of, you know, families they were raised in. It is just, we take care of each other. Um, I even had somebody that um, I work with in my secular job, who said to me one day, the main difference is that when my husband gets sick or something, I have to figure out who do I ask for help? And, you know, you've got people asking you, how can I help? Mm -hmm. right. And I'm like, well, you're welcome to join us 10 o'clock on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have told people that when I turned 50, I think it was, which was a while ago now, um, 
one of the biggest learnings I had in sort of shifting my life focus was that when I was younger, I thought life was basically kind of easy. And if, if it was hard for a while, it was because I was screwing up something. And then I got to a point where you just get older and you look around and you see what people have been through. And it's like, no, no, actually life is quite hard. Life is very hard yeah. <laughs> um, so, and if it's going well, you just pause and say, whew, this is good. But, but we take turns. And to me, that's been the big plus of community is just taking turns. Mm -hmm. It's like, ugh, it's really hard right now. Okay. <laughs> Come help right. me. Right, which for me <laughs> is I what, and that's what others. for me intercessory prayer is. I am feeling horrible about things right now, so bad that I don't even have the words to pray. So I'm going to let you pray for me. You have faith for me today because I can't have any faith. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. really what the church does: is you come together every week and say, you know, this. As you said, this week it's your turn to believe, because yeah. I'm not sure I can do that today. But next week maybe I'll be able to do that for you. Yeah. Well, and, and so that brings us to one of the things I tried to point out to folks as being the opportunity out of this crisis is now we're not just doing that on a weekly basis. We can't guarantee that we're going to be seeing people on Sundays. So we have to be much more intentional mm -hmm. about that reaching out, about staying in touch. And you know, in many ways, I've seen on Facebook a few times the, the quote, the church has left the building, um, that we, I remember writing on my personal statement from our, my profile 20 some odd years ago, uh, that the church was a revolving door where you come in, um, I don't remember the exact, you know, somebody you wrote on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I can't quote myself, but I, 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 was, I do remember comparing it to the revolving doors on St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where people come in um, to be filled and renewed and taught and educated and inspired, but then they are sent right back out into the world. Well, well right now, we're in the world. That's our only choice. <laughs> so we have to figure out right. how to better and mesh everything together into our daily lives, because we don't have that once a week Sunday morning where we're going to see Nancy. Let's keep picking on Nancy and her neighbor, um, <laughs> where we're going to see Nancy and we can say, oh, right, I was going to check in with her. Well, no, now you've got to remember during the week, I'd better check in with Nancy because I'm not going to see her on Sunday. Right. So, and, and that's where also the virtual church becomes much, I think, much more congregational based. It has to be congregational based. So the Baptists win. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, you cannot have that kind of sense of the body of Christ if it's just the minister trying to, to virtually reach all those people. You've, you really lose something. Plus, please remember, I'm still part-time. Right, <laughs> bivocational. Uh, so, so I do, and I know, I don't know what your experiences are, but I've been really impressed and heartened by how my congregation has been doing that this week. I mean, it's hard to believe it hasn't even been a full week. We had exactly. worship last Sunday. Uh, but, you know, this week we've been trying to figure out the delivery systems for how to get this out. But once we started putting those in place, man, we've, you know, people have been doing Zoom meetings. We've had a forum that just started yesterday that's already uh, lots of people have joined it and are talking. So, it really is very impressive. Now, how, how much that can keep going, you know, that's, we'll, we'll have to see, but. Um, well, I suggest that as we close this time together, <laughs> okay, that we look our, look our congregations in the eye, right at that camera. Say, <laughs> we're counting on you folks. <laughs> okay, that well, was and, probably a freaky moment, but. Uh, <laughs> But I, and I would encourage people to contact us uh, and, you know, let us know what you thought about this, what questions this raised for you, what answers you have, because obviously we're still looking for answers. Um, but we do want to know, you know, this doesn't, I don't want this to be a top down, I'm just going to take over the church during the COVID-19 crisis. No. Well, okay, you could take over the church, Lori. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's cool. We'll I don't, just, I don't want your church. <laughs> I, I love your church. I'm sure your church is fine. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. Well, and, and for from my perspective, um, my sisters have dragged me into now, <laughs> sort of, I mean, this is sort of not a sermon, but it is a sermon, that 
I don't often get the opportunity to preach. And for me, this has been really fun to be able to do this with my sibs, because again, we don't normally do this kind of thing. Um, and we've already talked about, do we keep doing this? Do we have different topics and things? So we're, we're, we're iterating, as they say, we're Iterate? trying to do it. something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that word. <laughs> That's a big wig word. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> we small rural pastors don't know that word. We, we never <laughs> iterate. You try something. <laughs> Yeah, I know that iterating stuff, that's, that's, <laughs> um, you try something, you learn from it, you do it again, slightly different. Ah. It's, you know, when you talk about the next iteration of something, oh, it's the you. verb form of it. that. I see. That's been our learning moment for the day. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> okay, but you're going to close us. I out, will right? close us in prayer. Yes. Okay. Um, so everybody, as we have already asked, if you would like to give us feedback um, on, on this, on this format and also just what you think about church and what you think about some of the, the questions and, and topics that we've been discussing here. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really distracted by the light in front of me and the way it keeps glaring on my glasses. I'm we can't see to, it. So okay. Fine. I'm fine. trying to keep myself unglared. Uh, so let's join in prayer. Creator God, we do give you thanks for technology. It doesn't always work the way we would ask it to work, but we, we give you thanks for the gift of the, the knowledge of the people who have invented all of these things that make it possible for us to now be in community, um, even when we're physically separated from one another. We ask that you be with each of our congregations, you be with all of our clergy, all of our congregation members, our lay leaders, as everyone seeks to come to a new understanding of how you would have us do church in these circumstances. We ask that you be with our medical communities and with folks giving care in nursing homes and care facilities because they are under particular stress and strain right now. We ask that you um, keep all of us smart about how we are moving forward and that you bring us all companionship in one another. In the name of your given son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.